Okay, let's get going. Well, a warm welcome to all of you who have joined the webinar and of course to our guests, Emily and Toby. Um, to set the scene, we all know that the digital commerce platform you choose can make and break uh, your uh, commerce strategy. But in an industry where everyone claims to offer composable, headless solutions, how can your business make the right decision? Last month, Forrester's B2C Wave report found no clear leader in the digital commerce market, making choosing a platform even harder. Today, we'll be covering how to, how to navigate an industry without a leader, what are must-have features for an e-commerce platform in 2024, what are the biggest trends currently shaping B2C commerce, and what defines a true market-leading B2C commerce solution today. We'll firstly have an update on the commerce landscape, followed by an open discussion, and of course, with a Q&A at the end. So time to introduce our guests. Firstly, we're delighted to have Emily Pfeiffer with us uh, as our featured speaker. Welcome, Emily. Thanks so much for having me. Emily serves digital business leaders in her comprehensive coverage of commerce technology, including order management systems, B2C commerce solutions, dropshipping and promotions. Emily conducts the Forrester Wave evaluations for B2C commerce and OMS, fueled by her fire flexible, inexpensive, rapid, and easy vision for commerce technology. She works with brands and retailers to guide their future fit strategies for platform and partner selection and management. Emily also advises commerce tech vendors on their go-to-market strategies. And also welcome to Toby Ring. Uh, as Managing Director Commercials at Scale Commerce Engine, Toby consults Scale's new and existing customers along all touch points of the e-commerce value chain. Scale is one of the fastest growing digital commerce providers in Europe, born out of the online fashion giant About You. Um, Scale now powers many enterprise customers, including Dijkman and Manchester United, for example. Welcome to you both. Um, a little bit of uh, housekeeping before we start. Please do ask questions throughout the session using the Q&A uh, feature in Zoom. Uh, we'll do our best to answer these at the end. And of course, the session will be recorded uh, and we'll email that out to uh, all attendees. So first off, Toby, let's talk about the first elephant in the room. Um, as we're talking a, a lot about the wave today, question for you, uh, what, why was scale not included in Forrester's digital commerce wave report? Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so at the time of the inclusion criteria that Forrester set last year in the summer, uh, scale didn't have a relevant Americas present. Yeah? Um, so back then we were not really active in the US market. However, on the back of being the fastest growing commerce uh, business in Europe, uh, we decided to change that. And as in the in the US since early this year, since January, I'm actually currently in New York attending Commerce Next. Um, so overall, very positive um, conversations we're having with friends and retailers. So this will definitely change going forward. And we hope to be included uh, in the next ones coming up. Fantastic. Makes sense. Thanks, Toby. Uh, so moving to you, Emily, uh, I know our audience are, of course, keen to hear more about the wave, but we can't have you on a webinar without asking you for your expert opinion on the current state of the digital commerce space. Um, could you take us through that, please? Of course. Yeah, I, I'll address kind of the, the other elephant, which is that lack of leaders in this evaluation, as you mentioned, Peter. Uh, it, it's unusual to have no leaders in a, a Forester wave. I think it happens once or twice a year. And we do somewhere around 100 waves a year. So, you know, it's it's maybe 2% of the evaluations. Um, when you're looking at a Forrester wave graphic like this one, just a, a quick tour to orient our, our viewers, um, you've got these kind of concentric circles coming out from the top right. You can see leaders, strong performers, contenders, and challengers. Uh, those circles indicate the position of the dots. The dots represent vendors. And those dots, on their scores. Just to be clear, we don't choose to put them where they are. The vertical axis is the current offering. That's the features and functionality and architecture of the product itself. And the horizontal axis is the strategy of the product. And I want to be clear about that. It's not the strategy of the overall company, which may have a huge portfolio of software in some cases. It's really the strategy for this product. And so when you have vendors who are kind of close to each other, we we say internally, we say there's not a lot of spread, right? They're a little bit clustered together and there's no one that's all the way up and to the right. It can indicate a few things. Right now in the market here are kind of the primary reasons why we're seeing this. So first, we didn't find that any one of these vendors was stellar at many different criteria. 
So in order to get kind of all the way up, there are lots of, you know, opportunities to get the highest scores in criteria. And these vendors all, or almost all, had a collection of high scores in different areas, but no one of them had many, many very high scores. This means that they're a little bit more specialized. They're less differentiated from each other right now at this snapshot in time. A, a wave is a snapshot. This is not a state of forever. It's a state of right now. And so right now, the vendors are struggling to differentiate from each other in many areas. The second reason is that most of these solutions can't rival the vendors that specialize in some of these areas. So in commerce, we don't expect to find a complete PIM, product information management. We don't expect to find a complete OMS, order management solution, or a complete commerce search solution. But we do expect to find certain functionality in those areas that you would expect embedded within a commerce solution. And at this point, the functionality that's embedded in those solutions is good. And in many cases, it's good enough, but it usually doesn't rival the standalone solution areas. So in order to get the highest scores in this evaluation, vendors needed to show functionality that was at least as good as the weakest standalone enterprise vendors in those categories. And this is a little bit new in our view of the market. The reason that I evaluated it that way is because I was getting calls from my clients, my brands and retailers who said, look, I'm using this commerce solution and it's promotions management or a commerce search functionality is not doing it for me. It's not enough. I need something better. I need a standalone. What can you recommend? And I'm looking at my scores and going, I, I gave those vendors a five, the highest score in the last evaluation for that functionality because it was better than the others. And it was misleading my readers. So it was really time in commerce, which is a very broad area that encompasses so many different types of functions. It was time to get clearer about when it's good and good enough, but not stellar compared to the standalone. We're also in a moment in which many B2C businesses are not in a buying cycle. It's an odd time. Usually most of the market isn't in the same place in their buying cycle, right? At any given moment, in my experience, 30%, sometimes even closer to half of the market is at least exploring, looking for a new commerce solution. But we're in a place right now where since 2020, a huge portion of the B2C businesses that have commerce solutions already replatformed. Many, many of them did. And so they're still within that kind of three to five year cycle when they're not interested in replatforming again. And this is something I, I personally have never seen a market in this state when so few businesses are looking to replatform. And I, I'm really very aware of that because I get the phone calls. When they want a new B2C commerce solution, they come to me to help find one. And that is not the call I'm getting right now. So I needed to write an evaluation that would help my readers for where they are today. And so lastly, you see that these vendors are all kind of pulling in toward the center. Here's what I mean by that. We've had a little bit of a dichotomy, kind of a polarization in the market for some years. We've had the vendors who are focused on being pure play, just commerce engines, completely headless, truly no head, right? Headless, no front end experience. Um, and they are dedicated to being really good at just that. It's usually newer solutions, modern architecture. And then you have solutions that are probably not new, maybe monolithic architecture, but very robust functionality, great scale and stability. They've been around for a long time, they're proven but it's kind of, it's a little bit more all in one. I don't like that term because what all, but, but it's much more robust functionality. And we've had this kind of push and pull between those two uh, types of positions in the market for a long time. But over the past couple of years, both types of solutions have really pulled in toward the center. So those more dedicated modern ones, they all have heads. There is no headless solution. It can be separate, it can be modular, but headless now probably means lots of heads. It's the opposite of headless. 
Okay. They've added more functionality. They've become more stable. They've tested more. They've uh, improved the usability for users. So they're getting closer to the center. And the vendors that have traditionally been more monolithic and, uh, you know, yes, robust, but stable and broad, they're adding more modules around the outside, even though they're not necessarily breaking apart the monolith. They do have additional modules like a head front end experience, for instance, and they too are making improvements all the time and, and saying they can be used in that more modular way. And you can see then how they're both kind of coming in toward the center. And so that differentiation is really hard to see in the market now, much harder than it's been for the past few years. Now this market is cyclical. We go through this kind of process again and again. If you're old like me, you've seen it happen already, it will keep happening again. Where, and, and by the way, the entire market is not always in the same place in this cycle. And that's important to remember as well. It depends on what they bought, when they bought it, what their needs are today, how they've evolved. But the cycle tends to go like this. It's too complex. The tech that's available to me in commerce technology is too complex. And the first time that this happened was a couple of decades ago when commerce was this separate thing that was isolated from the rest of the business. And then it started to kind of split apart into different pieces and you wound up with you know, the email service provider and then just the order management system, just you know, content management and businesses were overwhelmed. And some of the largest software companies said, don't worry about it, I got you. And they started buying up, building some, but mostly acquiring other pieces and saying, now we have a suite, an end-to-end -end suite. Aren't you glad? You can get it all from me. It'll be so much simpler. And so we went into this simplify part of the cycle. It sounded really appealing. But the selling point was, you use us for this product, so you'll love using us for that product. Or it'll be better, faster, easier, cheaper to integrate the solutions together because I own them all. And those promises fell flat, right? When I say to my customer, how do you feel about your relationship with that vendor? When it's one of these very large vendors, they say, for which product? They have different salespeople, different customer success people, a completely different experience, even though technically it's under the same logo. And the easier to integrate, easier to, to work together, it's not true if they're still the separate solutions that the company acquired. If they haven't been refactored and brought together into a unified platform, there isn't really a benefit to, again, that logo being on it. So that simplification seemed very appealing. It didn't really pan out. And then businesses found that they were stuck with this one vendor. They felt locked in. You hear vendor lock in, right? They felt stuck with this one vendor. And like they didn't have the flexibility they needed. They didn't have the um, kind of the, the robust functionality. And so they began to add those specialty solutions again. And you can see how as we add and we accumulate, it, be, it can become too complex again. And so this cycle, sorry, this cycle kind of continues over time. What that simplification looked like at one time was suites. And then adding specialty was a standalone OMS, a standalone CMS, right? But in a more modern context, as we've kind of come through this cycle again, maybe it looks more like when I'm adding more specialty, I'm going headless. And again, going headless in many cases means adding another head because whatever was built in to my monolithic commerce solution is no longer adequate. Sometimes it means going with a solution that has a separate head or none at all, though at this point, nobody really has none at all, but it did at one time mean using just a commerce solution alone. But headless means that front-end experience is separate. And when that becomes too complex, now the experience we're having is maybe what I want is something more unified. And we're hearing the term unified commerce. It means nothing. But it's a way to think about the goal of having fewer places for users to log in, fewer solutions to manage. And again, that one platform so that we're not just integrating things together without any real benefit to receiving more functionality from one vendor. So you can see how you know, humans make decisions from pain. We wind up in a point where there's something we have to solve, we do the work to fix it, and we continue to do that. We're not really back in the same place. It's a different version of simplification, a different version of specialty that, that adds to complexity. But this is the cycle that we go through in commerce tech. 
So now we polled, we surveyed digital leaders and we asked if they were adding more functionality from many different vendors, consolidating to fewer solutions from fewer vendors or doing both simultaneously. And you can see that the adding and consolidating is almost 40% each, it's about even. And you know, 20, 25% said we're, we're doing both. And the ones who were doing both were mainly in the APAC region and under special circumstances. So we really wanted to dig in and understand what's different about the organizations that are adding more versus consolidating. And now again, you can imagine thinking about that cycle. Some of them are on one side, some of them are on the other, right? What's different about them? Disappointingly, the answer is not very much. Okay, for the most part, these organizations are extremely similar. Their regions, their size, their business model, the types of products they sell, products versus services, industry, there weren't that many big patterns that we found different, except for one. The largest organizations 5,000 or more employees were meaningfully more likely to be consolidating. And this was really interesting to me. This is data from 2023, from last year. At a time when so much of the market, like in the kind of, like is still saying, the biggest enterprises, they understand they need best of breed, right? Best in class, more pieces. They, they, they're not going to settle for good enough. That's not what my data is showing. It doesn't mean that they've never made that decision. These are probably more technically mature, digitally mature organizations, and they have stuff to consolidate. To be clear, they've already added, and they're feeling that pain of the complexity. I get calls from some of the biggest brands in the world saying, I have thousands of vendors. I need hundreds, please. Help me figure out where I can consolidate or across my regions and my sub-brands, I'm using six different commerce solutions and three OMSs help. Or in my commerce environment, I have so many different pieces and there are a few vendors I really trust. How can I figure out if they can do more for me so I can fire some of the smaller ones who are taking my money and not adding that much value, right? So this consolidation is coming on the heels of expansion. But right now in the market, the largest companies are thinking more about consolidation than adding. So let's revisit a little bit some of these points I really wanted to um, pull out in particular. This is a commentary on the state of the market. And you can see how vendors aren't amazing at all of those tangential functions that you often find in specialty solutions like OMS and CMS. And so they're pulling in toward that center. I wanted to spend a little bit more time here. When you think about the philosophy in the market, when you think about the messaging that you hear and how it's sort of speaking to you, think about how the messaging plays into your pain. Do you want to have more from less? Do you want to have fewer vendors that you have to get approval to buy from? Do you want to have less to integrate? Or do you want to be less stuck? You want more flexibility. Right, so Peter mentioned model earlier, flexible, inexpensive, rapid, easy. Everyone always wants their tech to be more flexible, inexpensive, rapid, and easy. But depending on where they are in that cycle, these different sides seem more appealing. But now those broader solutions become more modular. The pure plays add the heads and more functionality and more stability. And so the conversation becomes more complex, it has to because now you're trying to select a commerce solution and you don't have these kind of lanes that you can stay in and align to a philosophy. So it's more complex, but we can boil it down this way. What you need to find is a non-monolithic ideal. So this is perfect world, okay? You want robust functionality within reason. So in commerce, you're looking for those core pieces of functionality that you absolutely need to get from commerce, like cart and checkout, some level of merchandising and categorization. It's really the path to purchase. 
that is the most fundamental core stuff from commerce. But you're also in a perfect world looking for the good enough. A commerce vendor that has enough included that saves you from having to buy more pieces, maybe ever, or maybe just right now. It's okay to phase it, but you really want to have fewer trusted vendors in the ecosystem, especially now while we're thinking so much about the bottom line and looking really hard at the economy, right? The second piece is a unified user experience. When we have vendors who have made a lot of acquisitions and they've brought different solutions together or even built a newer solution, often it's a separate place to log in. It's a different experience. And sometimes there's an explanation like, well, it's role-based. You know, different people log into different places to do different things. I don't buy it. You can manage this with permissions. You can give access only to the pieces that a user needs to access. Managing multiple UIs is work for the customer organization. They need to ramp, they need to train, they need to support their users. And when they're separate solutions, but integrated, it's not the same thing as one platform where the customer record, the order record, they're one database that's shared rather than data that's flying between. So I'm looking for that unified experience built on a single platform. And then we want the architecture to be modular. That means that individual pieces of it can be deployed separately. They can be upgraded or updated separately. They can be removed when it's time to replace them with a standalone solution. And it means we're paying for them by the module as well, right? That's, that's a little bit telltale is when you get the whole thing and it's one price, whether or not you're using it, right? So we really wanna think about it in a modular way. This is very hard to find, but this is the ideal. And so it's up to you as a digital business to decide where to prioritize, which of these pieces are most important to you today. And again, think about a phased approach. You don't have to do it all tomorrow. So finally, look for these differentiators in 2024 when you're thinking about B2C commerce solutions. First, is it in the cloud? This is the number one reason why the few who are still replatforming just in the next one or two years are looking. If you're not on the cloud yet, it's time to get there. This is the best reason to replatform. Two, is it simple to add more functionality that might mean via an app store, via pre-built connections, other owned modules that are really easy, and I mean days to weeks, not weeks to months or years. What does it take to add more functionality from that same vendor? Third, and this is often neglected, think about culture fit. Culture fit might mean that simple kind of human connection thing. How do I feel when I'm in the room with the vendor? How do they make me feel? Do, they, do I feel like they value me and my business? But it's also a matter of how they communicate, right? Some digital businesses are just looking for software. Give me the software, leave me alone. Others want to hear from their customer success manager every week. They want to be handheld. Some want community where they can talk to their peers and get support that way events that they can go to and have those conversations in person. So really think about the culture fit. It will have a big impact on how you feel in the long run about your vendor. And finally, look for the balance. That ideal is kind of impossible right now. So find the balance that works for you between the functionality that you need, the architecture that will work so that you're not stuck, you're flexible enough, but you can manage it now. And then just don't forget to think about the experience of your user. Over to you, Toby. Perfect, yeah. Uh, over to Peter, right? Shall we do yeah, well, Peter, I'm please. Just, uh, sorry to jump in. I was just saying that really, really insightful update, Emily. I love uh, especially the um, the culture fit topic. That's that's often mm. neglected uh, in conversations. I um, agree. But yeah, Toby, I know you have some questions on mm. um, you yeah. know, how potential buyers um, of store technology can get a, a better understanding of their options. So, mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think super clear, Emily, how you describe an ideal setup, right? Um, and many brands and retailers I also talked here in the New York, in New York over the past few days said they apply a phased approach. Yeah? From their monolithic solution, they go towards headless, which for them means adding uh, basically headless front end towards the monolithic backend and then moving composable in the backend. Yeah? 
do you see that also a lot and and what would you answer um to, to people who have this in mind for their face, face approach i'm glad that it's a phase I, I i think it's good that they're thinking about it that way um and you you defined it right the, this idea of headless is really just a modularization of commerce tech, which as you saw in kind of my cycle, it's something that's been happening for a really long time already. Headless was just a term that kind of got legs in, in the industry that vendors were amplifying. And so folks started using it. Um, but it just means decoupling the commerce engine from the front end experience solution, right? And so if you're on a monolith, it is a logical progression to separate the front end. But I don't want people to feel like you must go from monolith to headless to composable for two reasons. One, that might not be the most important thing for you right now. You might get value from a different module being added. I'm not sure that the front end is the most important thing. And two, that's not a set path. It's just marketing language. Right. So I, I talked about headless. Composable doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. It just means modular. Again, it's just the new way to say modular. And maybe it means more modular than it used to be. Maybe it means more vendors. But the important way to think about it is what am I missing today? What will get me results quicker right now without too much lift from me? And with that path forward, like you said, phased is good. But don't worry about the terms, worry about the business problem to solve, the technical function that will solve it, and where you can find that tech today in trusted partners. Cool, perfect, thanks. And I think then the, the other question, as you outlined in your survey, that even the most large companies who would, I would assume, are digitally relatively mature, try to reduce the number of solutions that they have in play for the commerce stack, right? So would you, do you see in the market like a composable or best of breed regret yeah, that people basically mm. went all the way towards that and now are actually figuring it's too costly, too expensive, not fast enough for me? Yes. And it's uh, unfortunately quiet. Um, some of the marketing messaging around all of this over the past few years has sounded like if you're smart enough, if you're technical enough, if you're digitally mature enough, if you're enterprise enough, this is the way for you. Why would you want just good enough when you can have the best in all of these different pieces? And it sounded great. And it especially appealed to the more technical side of the business, right? You can be more flexible. You won't be stuck. You'll be able to make changes. And I believe more of the market went that way than should have. And some learned that it was too much and maybe unnecessary for them. But because the messaging was, if you are good enough, then this is for you. When it turned out not to be for them, they didn't go back and say, you oversold me. You didn't manage my expectations. I didn't understand what I was getting into. This was really not for me. They felt that they had failed. I wasn't good enough. And so some leaders are not being open about those regrets, which is making it hard for others to come to that conclusion and, and make the changes that they need to make as well. So I, again, you know, it is cyclical, it comes around, but this, this is happening really quickly, some of that regret. It's not everyone, but it's enough of the market. We made a prediction, um, I think two years ago, we said a, about a third of digital businesses will regret playing software company. And that's what we meant. And I'm sort of hearing from, from partners and implementation providers, they, they're like, yeah, I, I think you were conservative on the number, right? So it's, it's not everyone. Some, for some, it is necessary because they need that level of flexibility and they have incredible internal bench depth in, in their technical teams, but it's not for everyone. I am absolutely seeing some trying to come back from it now. Okay. Perfect, cool. And I think then another question in all the events we are attending, Shop Talk and, and so forth, Commerce Next, everyone talks about AI, one-on-one uh, -on -one personalization and so forth. And then we start the discussion with brands and retailers and we do see that they are saying, yeah, wait a minute, I first want to connect my stores towards my commerce backend. Yeah? Mm. So very much on, on the omnichannel uh, side of the house. So I'm just wondering, like, how do you see the convergence of online and offline digital touch points 
going forward? Are we already have a tick mark on that one? Or is it still uh, very much on the forefront for brands and retailers in the actual daily doing? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked it that way. Um, AI is important. It's everywhere. That's great. Let your vendors figure it out right now. Let them bring it to you as a viable solution when it's ready. But absolutely, there are operational things that brands and retailers still need to figure out that are standard and expected for consumers. So, um, you know, we, we did a study not long ago. We looked at 60 different retailers to see how and when they communicated inventory availability and delivery options to their customers, right? Can I see what's available in the store near me? Can I add things to cart where it's a mixed delivery? Some are for pickup, some are for shipping. Um, do I see an actual promise for, with a delivery date or is it most orders ship within two days and arrive within five to seven days, right? Like, is it generic or is it really helpful, um, really specific, really accurate? And many, many retailers still don't have that down. Many of them still don't have that kind of omni-channel experience between digital and physical. You know, it's, we think of it as multi-channel, across channels, omni-channel. Consumers don't care. They don't say, I'm going to have an omni-channel experience. And I'm going to buy online and pick up in store. They don't think that way. They just expect every interaction with an entity, with a brand, to be consistent. If I've told you something here, I expect you to know it there. And I want it to feel like you know me the same way in all of these channels. So absolutely, that's, I don't even want to say low-hanging fruit because it's not easy, but it is more important than focusing on the next shiny thing. Yeah, we, it's not checked off yet. We do still have work to do there. Perfect. Thanks. Good questions. Cool. Peter, over to you. Yeah, just to jump on uh, on the back of that one, uh, who do you think does this well then in terms of the omni-channel piece? Mm, without naming retailers in particular, I'll, I'll say that what it takes to do it well is an understanding of the customer in all channels. Um, so if there's an app and a website and a store, it should be easy for me to see all of the purchases I've made in all of those places whether I'm in the store talking to an associate on the app on my phone or at a computer on a website, right? Everything should be um, consistent and communicated. There's also, there's something called zero party data. Uh, Forrester coined this term. This is a term that means information about me as a consumer that I knowingly and willingly communicate to a retailer. Right. So if I'm shopping for cosmetics and I fill out the form that says, you know, I'm old, but I still have acne. I'm, you know, whatever it is, I'm, I'm weirdly pale. I, I fill all of that out. I'm telling that retailer things about me. I then expect it to surface for me products that are more accurate to me. You know, don't show me something that an 18 year old can use. It won't work for my skin. So when you're collecting that zero party data, when they're giving it to you willingly, you really need to make sure you're using it in all the places. If I then walk into that physical store, I expect them to pull up my account, know who I am and know all of the information that I've provided in all of those channels. So in order to do that really well, that's what a retailer is doing. They understand loyalty, they understand history, they understand activity, and they've pulled it throughout all of the experiences. Awesome. No, that makes sense. Thanks for that. Uh, I didn't realize Zero Party was one of yours. That's that's good. <laughs> Very um, brilliant um, analyst coined that. Yeah, she's nice. amazing. Nice one. Um, so, Emily, your point about the non-monolithic ideal uh, really resonates with what I'm hearing from customers. And it's also an area that scale is especially strong in. Um, Toby, uh, can you tell us a bit more about scale? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so our key mission is to empower brands and retailers, enterprise brands and retailers, to create outstanding shopping experience. Yeah, and there you really need to take into consideration the resources that you have and obviously the tech architecture on which you are built on. And when we move to the next slide, there's basically three main reasons why companies go with scale. Now, on the one hand side, very unique in the market, I would say our unique retail DNA you know, as part of the About You group with our sister company About You, who is um, running 5 billion in GMV on the scale platform and scale had been developed to support exactly that use case. We do have quite extensive features and functionalities in the backend, which are extremely well designed for retail. And secondly, and I touched that further, is on the technology side of the house, um, where, where we provide on the one hand side 
a very feature-rich backend, but at the same time, full flexibility uh, in how you uh, use individual components. And then thirdly, in particular for large enterprises, it is a journey on which they are on whenever they change the architecture uh, for the commerce stack. Yeah? So they are, they are looking for a strong partner who can help them, advise them how to make the best move. And obviously all our solutions are implemented by solution partners, but still they want an advice from the software vendor what to do next, uh, basically along the journey. Uh, so you look there at, at basically the support, at joint co-innovation as well, uh, and obviously full alignment of incentives. But I think the, the absolute core is, is rightly shown here, uh, where we truly believe that scale is a new paradigm in commerce tech. And we have the two extremes. We have monolith solutions, where you get everything from one vendor, which is great because you have a unified experience with lots of functionality in, but you see in the white box displayed, you cannot break out. Uh, you can basically not easily integrate the best new search solution, the best new AI tool you want to integrate. It's very hard because it has never been designed for that. And then on the other hand side, you have the microservice architecture where you have much lower um, features and functionalities out of the box, but full flexibility in adding individual pieces. Uh, but the challenge here is clearly that you then have much more interfaces to manage on the one hand side to build, but also to maintain. And the business users are left behind with various user interfaces they need to jump in. One for promotion, one for search, one for the pricing, uh, and one actually for handling the orders that you successfully um, received. So we are combining best of both worlds. Now we call it today unified and composable, where we say we have a highly uh, modular architecture where you can select the individual modules you want to use. But at the same time, we bring already vast, vast majority of the functionality towards the table, towards the customer, um, who can then select throughout um, his or her journey how to best um, make use of those functionalities. And what we see is that customers go live quickly. Uh, just another eyewear retailer who went live today with us. It took them just two or three months in the enterprise world. That is quite fast. And now they can select, do they want to stay with a search of scale or do they want to opt for a best of breed search solution in the market because they see better value of it. Yeah, but they are live, they're operational, they can see, they can test. Uh, and that is really the big, big difference uh, that we are seeing. And at the second time, um, when, when we jump one slide back, sorry, Emily, a little bit too fast for me, uh, that, that, that we really see that business users have strong value from this approach. Yeah, they can configure everything themselves they don't need to open up a ticket, wait for precious development resources, but they can really um, uh, do things by themselves, even complex logic, without asking a developer. When we jump now on the next slide, you see the, the underlying architecture, um, which again is built on the most modern principles, so headless, API-driven, cloud-native, and composable. And you then see on the right-hand side, in a quite simplistic architecture overview, everything in green, which is natively built by scale, maintained and continuously advanced. Uh, and those include in the co commerce technology part, a PIM, shop management, search, promotion, omnichannel, checkout, and OMS. Uh, again, customers can use it, but they don't have to use it. Uh, as an example, our search is used by 90% of our customers, PIM is used by 50% of our customers, and thereby they can really make best use of where they see fit, but have already a strong um, solution readily out of the box. Next to the um, capabilities, we do have the two important um, API components, the admin API, where you can connect any uh, supply source and the storefront API, which is based on Go uh, and very uh, performance optimized, um, connecting either to our own storefront accelerator or any third party custom storefront. Uh, you still have the opportunity for custom build or third party solutions to be integrated for on the far right. Uh, you see that here as well through the add-ons which Emily also rightly outlined, which are key, right? Because there is, for example, the personalization space, really strong best of breed solution on the CMS space, two domains that we are not doing today because we truly believe the solutions which are in the market are much better than the things that we could provide. Now, when we look on the next slide, um, it just gives you a flavor on whom are we actually supporting. Yeah? Um, and really one of the, or some of the largest enterprises in the world, they drive differentiation jointly with scale. About you, I think it's clear, the world's largest online fashion store for Gen Y and Z, they are uh, transacting more than 5 billion in GMV through scale. But then also many others, such as Manchester United, 
who is shipping to more than 150 countries uh, with us. Um, Deichmann Groups joined with Snipes, European's largest retailer. They are connecting more than 4,500 stores to us to really unlock the omnichannel experience. And then we also have Fieldman, one of the leading optician retailers, um, who have, due to their contact lenses, uh, quite complex variants. So more than 12,000 variants they can easily handle with us. And there are many more brands and retailers who really see fit in the best combination of a modern architecture and extensive features, which bring them live quickly and let them scale initially. Uh, we are the fastest growing commerce platform in the world uh, at the moment, have been growing more than 50% over the last year, and we are uh, highly recommended when you look at individual um, review platforms such as the ones listed here. Um, so also quite proud that the customers we support are very happy um, and, and driving growth forward with us. That's it from, from my side. Over to you, Pete. Fantastic. Thanks, Toby. Um, so as promised, we've got some time for some questions. I can see uh, a few that have come through, some good ones. Um, so first one, uh, for Emily, um, which capabilities did you evaluate in the wave? Mm. Uh, many. Uh, I think I had 34 criteria, something, 30 something, um, quite a bit. It's uh, every wave evaluation has to do a good job of evaluating more than any one business will ever need, right? So, so I'm writing, I'm writing an evaluation that is based on the needs of a non-existent hypothetical business that somehow needs everything because the real businesses who then come to me only need certain things, but they all have to be there because everyone needs something different. So, um, the way I looked at it for this evaluation was to look at those core commerce functionalities that we expect every enterprise commerce solution to just be really good at. And then to look at the more kind of tangential pieces that you might find from standalone. And then to look at the more specialty areas as well. Um, so it, it's interesting. There are some, I, I don't know, I'll take subscriptions as an example. Uh, this is functionality that I actually evaluate in commerce and in order management. I have it in, in both. I have historically had it in both waves. Um, you can also have a standalone subscriptions management solution. Uh, and so looking at it in a wave evaluation like this that doesn't focus on subscriptions is dicey, right? You have to keep it kind of high level. We don't expect it to be as good as the standalone. But that's an example of a uh, criterion that some of my clients are looking for, others have it handled. They've got a vendor who does that specifically. Um, search as another example, there was only one vendor who got the highest score because what they had rivaled at least some of the enterprise standalone solutions for commerce search. So I really tried to make this weighted to the most important core functionality while being inclusive of all of the pieces I hear from the market they're looking for in a commerce solution. Yeah, that makes sense. Fantastic, thank you. Um, okay, another one here. Um, why should I not just buy all the best tools in the market for my teams? Uh, can I answer that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it sounds great. It sounds great. Like, let, let, just go get all the best things. Um, someone said that to me kind of early in my forester tenure, like, obviously, everyone just wants all the best, just go get all the best of breed. I said, have you ever met a CFO? <laughs> right? No CFO is like, yes, let me just write you another check. Fantastic. What else do you need? Um, digital businesses have budgets, they have limitations, and they have to prove the value of the solutions they're bringing in. So what's more important than I need an OMS is I have a business problem to solve right? And let's figure out what solution will solve it. Let's measure the results of it. And when the solution is good enough, and I can get the good enough from a vendor I already have in my ecosystem who I like and trust, by the way, that's that culture fit, right? It matters. I like them and I trust them and they do a good job at this. If what I can get from them is good enough, even if it's only good enough for now, that flies. No business... Hmm. almost no business says, I just want the best of the best across the board. I actually had one client say that once. I am the best. I only buy the best. I want best of read across the board. Deep pockets. Very fun project. Really unusual. 
And and uh, that particular customer, then, if I can ask, uh, obviously not naming names or anything, how ha how happy were they with the outcome in the end? I don't want to say that they're never happy, but they're never done. <laughs> it's do you know what I mean? It's it's always yeah. you know it's it's a it's a perpetual motion machine. It's a mm -hmm. constant process because commerce technology is a lava lamp. Yeah. And, you know, the bubbles break apart, they come back together, they, you know, it's, it's another way to think about that cycle. And so I, I think they're happy with their decision, because they really, they can afford it. And they have very strong internal teams to support all of the solutions they bring in. So I think they're happy with it, but they are an anomaly. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And I think the fact that it's a lava lamp is probably why we keep working in the commerce space. It's never boring. <laughs> it's not boring. No. Uh, that's fantastic. Well, those are the main questions. Unless you've got any any further ones, Toby, um, I think we can uh, we can wrap it up there. Okay. So yeah, um, just want to remind you then that we'll email out the recording of this uh, to every all the attendees. Thank you again so much for attending. Uh, thank you, especially Emily, uh, uh, guest speaker, and also Toby. Um, if you have any questions, uh, the QR code is there. Please go ahead and scan it. You can send those questions in. That'll take you to the the, the scale website. Um, and yes, um, uh, hopefully, uh, looking forward to joining you at the next one. Thank you very much. Thanks. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.